whose name will come to me in a minute, actually got an appointment about the time my book came out to teach at Barnard College, which is part of Columbia University, a school I attended and Yitzchak Sokolov also attended. We were there together. But what happens is you can make these kind of statements that defy common notions of history and yet advance in an academic, in an academic uh, framework. There is a professor also at University of Michigan who started to assert in the last number of years that the Jews didn't really have an ancient presence in this land. And this material comes out, is asserted in front of students. Students are young, students have to get good grades, they don't want to have a fight with the professor. But this kind of stuff comes out and completely undermines the state of Israel, undermines our history. You know what? It undermines our common civilization. When I've presented this before, not in this kind of a format, but what I often will do is I will put up archaeological finds which completely contradict these wild assertions. So for example, in the last number of years, Israeli archaeologists found royal seals of the kings of Judah. You, know, you don't have to find a history book. You have royal seals that actually belong to the kings of Judah. There's a seal for King Hezekiah, Hezekiah Melech, which has been found. So you get some professor from the University of Michigan who says the Jews had no connection to this land, and then you have an ancient Hebrew, a royal seal of the king of Judah who ruled here, sort of puts those professors in an awkward position. We'll let them feel awkward. So in many ways, classical diplomacy which used to be sitting down and writing a brilliant cable back to your foreign ministry, has been replaced by new types of diplomacy, asserting your history. It's very commonly said that, well, you know what? Even if we grant you Jews the possibility that you were here before, you left. You had no presence. After the destruction of the temple, it was all over. And then you came back with the Europeans in the 19th century. You know, that's sort of your superficial survey of Jewish history in the Holy Land. Well, there are things that are being found all the time which stun those who are not even aware of it. For example, do you know documents that have God's name on them. You can't just throw them in the garbage when you're finished with them. You can't find an ancient trash compactor and put them in there. Documents in our tradition are put into a special room or box called a Geniza. And ancient documents have been found actual documents have been found in the most famous of all these Genizot, the Cairo Geniza. So for example, at about the time of the Muslim conquest of Jerusalem in the seventh century, in the 600s, the Jewish community came back to Jerusalem for the first time in ma en masse since the destruction of the temple. You know, there had been an edict of Hadrian, the Roman emperor, that Jews couldn't live in Jerusalem. They couldn't even live on the hills from which you could see Jerusalem. But now, after the Muslim conquest, the Jews came back. They built synagogues. They built up the Jewish quarter. But like many impoverished Jews, 
who did not have the capability to really build up their, um, their structures, their buildings, their presence in Jerusalem, they reached out to wealthier Jewish communities to make a donation to help. Well, in those days, the wealthy Jewish community was in Cairo. So they wrote letters in Judeo-Arabic. Judeo-Arabic is Arabic with Hebrew letters to the Jewish community in Cairo asking for help, saying now in the seventh century we can live back in Jerusalem. So we actually have documentary evidence of a Jewish community here in Jerusalem in the seventh century that came back. And there's all kinds of these pieces of amazing historical proof of an extensive Jewish community. I'll just tell you one more um, fascinating piece of evidence. I used it in my book, and I make reference to it many times. When you serve as ambassador to the UN, you get these um, kind of broad brush impressions that people have of the connection of the Jewish people to Jerusalem. And again, one of those impressions is, and I made reference to it before, we came back here with the imperial powers. So we were a kind of an extension of European imperialism. And people are stunned to learn that there was a substantial Jewish presence here in Jerusalem, in the 1700s, in the 1800s, finally in, I would say, 1864, there was a Jewish majority already in Jerusalem as Jews streamed back to their ancient capital. A Jewish majority. And how do we know that? If you go to the public record office, those are the archives of Great Britain. You can find the reports of the British consulate in Jerusalem, and there is a report from 1864 which I got a hold of, which says quite openly, straight out, that the Jews were the majority in Jerusalem then. Contrary to the general impression, and certainly contrary to the uh, way the Jewish connection to Jerusalem is often sold. That cable, as I said before, is in the actual British archives, can be photocopied, and it shows the special connection in Jerusalem. Jerusalem was not a convenient place to visit under Ottoman rule, but people came back. And the Christian community here began to grow at the same time. So we are bombarded by a false history, which not only penetrates UNESCO and UN bodies, it penetrates academia, it penetrates the mass media, and it's very important to set the truth, to set what really happened here, to tell the truth. And that means you have to get a hold of real documents, real texts to prove it. And put those who are trying to erase our connection to Jerusalem on the defensive. And that's what has to be done. If you write a book like I wrote, that's one way. If you use the, your media connections, that's another way. But the truth has to be told and not let the purveyors of historical lies prevail. Thank you, I'll take a few questions. Dr. Gold, my name's Hugh Kitson. I'm director and producer of a um, documentary film called Whose Land, which we did with Colonel Richard Kemp. Sure. This is just the first part, and a lot of what you have said is actually in this 
documentary, and we're about to do a second part, which focuses on the legitimacy of Jerusalem in international law. Um, as you have pointed out, uh, Consul James Finn did this census in 1863-64, and actually the first diplomatic mission ever to um, establish itself in Jerusalem was the British diplomatic mission in the old city of Jerusalem, which was a majority city, Jewish city at that time. Today, very sadly, the British government does not recognize Israeli sovereignty over any part of Jerusalem. What do you think about that? International positions of Jerusalem are often based on partial or false considerations. Let's take what was here before 1948. Have the international community assigned Jerusalem to anybody? Well, the answer is yes. The League of Nations, which was the authoritative source of international principles before there was a United Nations, had adopted, had adopted the, um, not just the Balfour Declaration, but the uh, mandate document for the British mandate which talked about, and I'm now quoting, reconstituting, that was the word used, reconstituting a Jewish homeland in this territory. It didn't set aside Jerusalem, oh, that's the exception, that should be an international zone, it didn't say that. And what does reconstitute mean? It means reestablish, reestablish something that existed before. So, you know, what can I say? Foreign offices and foreign ministries should read the relevant documents. Now, oftentimes, I have seen references by international diplomats to the term corpus separatum, a Latin term meaning separate entity, which comes from the partition plan in 1947. This was adopted by the UN General Assembly. We're beyond the era of the League of Nations. And the proposal put forward by the United Nations General Assembly was to partition British Mandatory Palestine into a Jewish state and an Arab state. And the area of Jerusalem, which was defined very broadly, included Ramallah, included Bethlehem, that area would become this separate entity or an international zone. Now, what happened with Resolution 181? It was adopted by the UN General Assembly, that is true. But the Arab states refused. They rejected it. And since it was a General Assembly resolution, it did not create binding international law. It created a recommendation that states could follow. If Israel and the Palestinian Arabs at the time had accepted 181, we accepted it on our side. That might be a basis for saying there was something binding in what had been adopted, but they rejected it. And therefore it became irrelevant. So, the legal history of all this is that Jerusalem had been assigned to the Jewish people. And in the first Arab-Israeli war, the Jews had accepted Resolution 181, accepted their position in Jerusalem, but the Arabs rejected it. So there was no kind of legal title that was created from 1947 onward. Now, the last piece of this whole puzzle is in 1967. George, uh, 
Jerusalem had been partitioned by events. When the Arab Legion invaded Jerusalem, along with other Arab states, and um, well, they had actually the invasion occurs in 1948, but in 1967, as the Egyptians are massing their forces in Sinai and opening fire, and Israel takes a preemptive airstrike against the air forces of the air forces of the region. As all that occurs, Israel needs to preempt on the ground, and Israel captures Jerusalem, the old city, which it had been denied for 18 years. It captures the old city and reestablishes the Jewish presence in Jerusalem. But notably, Israel didn't one day decide, oh, you know what, we're going to invade the old city of Jerusalem. This was not a war of aggression. It was a war of self-defense. Now, in international law, if one party seizes territory as a result of a war of aggression, which was the case of the Arab states, while another party seizes land as a result of a war of self-defense, the party who seizes that very same territory in a war of self-defense has a superior legal claim. The man who made that assertion, his name was Stephen Schwebel. Not exactly a household name that I would expect all of you to know if we were having a quiz. Stephen Schwebel was an academic who wrote an article in the most important legal journal in international law, the American Journal of International Law. He wrote it in 1970 in response to the Rogers plan. And Schwebel made this distinction between wars of self-defense and wars of aggression. Supporting Israel's claim in 1970 to sovereignty over all of Jerusalem. Now, Schwebel didn't stop there writing academic arg articles in obscure journals. He became the legal advisor to the US Department of State. And afterwards, he got one more upgrade in his career. He became the president of the International Court of Justice in The Hague. Now, not everything that comes out of The Hague is to our liking. But Schwebel's distinctions and Schwebel's writing acquired moral force that Israeli diplomats could use. I remember when Chaim Herzog was the Israeli ambassador to the United Nations, he would make reference to Schwebel's writings. So those writings had a force that would even go into the speeches of the United Nations ambassador of the State of Israel. So, um, Israel has legal rights that are fre frequently forgotten. They could be rooted in the population balance of the 19th century. They could be rooted in the resolutions adopted by the League of Nations and later the United Nations. And they could be rooted in the circumstances of military operations and wars that broke out, particularly the 1967 Six Day War. But Israel has a claim, and a very strong claim. Uh, yeah, my name is Harun Ibrahim. I'm from Abu Ghosh, as I said, and director of Al Hayat Channel. I want to salute you for, for a book that I read, your book, The Hatred's Kingdom. I read it in Arabic, and it's really good translation, actually. I, I love that book. We made a 90-minute document about, about that book. Um, my question is that, is there any chance that we can read soon a book written by Dr. Gold about the real beginning of the terrorism that is in the Middle East, which is uh, 570 AD started by the birth of Muhammad, which is actually, that is really the beginning where of the root of the hatreds against the Jews. 
because if we're expecting peace with Arabs, it, Islam is not really the, <laughs> the, the religion that is uh, the peacemaking. So I, I really want to, to just like see a, this history, how are we going to read this as good as that book that opened my eyes and many, many others? Well, thank you for the compliment, but I'm going to have to disappoint you. I'm not going to call for reopening the Crusades. <laughs> Frankly, we've had our ups and downs with Islam and various Islamic movements, but there have been ups. I told you that um, Hadrian for, uh, enforced laws to keep Jews out of Jerusalem after the Bar Kokhba revolt in 135. So who allowed us to come back into Jerusalem? A man whose name you know, Umar bin al-Khattab, the second caliph of Islam. And, you know, if you want to make a real strong case against the Muslims, this is an inconvenient fact. I think we have to learn to live together. I'm going to tell you a story. I got to know, my relationship with Saudi Arabia has had its ups and downs. And when I wrote the book, Hatred's Kingdom, clearly it was a down. And one of the reasons I wrote a book called Hatred's Kingdom it's because after 9-11, there was a big international debate of what created the hatred that generated the 9-11 attacks. And I saw there were Saudi spokesmen who were saying, it's the Israeli-Palestinian conflict. Rubbish. Total rubbish. But I wanted to prove that the hatred had another source. And the hatred had to do with the revival of jihad as a doctrine, particularly um, by, um, by the founders, the spiritual founders of Saudi Arabia, Muhammad ibn Abdul Wahhab, and uh, the very tough conquests they had in the Arabian Peninsula at that time, in the 18th century. Now, not everybody followed that hardline doctrine. And there were those who resisted it. And there were those who preached some kind of mutual understanding. One area, one country where I've seen that is Morocco, under various kings of Morocco. Not all of them. There were some bad events there that occurred. But not everything was as dark as, as one could depict it. In the case of Saudi Arabia, when I wrote that book, I went to our military. I said, how much of the Hamas budget comes from Saudi Arabia? This is about 2003. And the Israeli military told me between 50 and 70 percent. Today, at least the last time I checked, Zero comes from Saudi Arabia. Most of it comes from Iran. Now, does that mean I, I you know, give Saudi Arabia a clean bill of health? You know, uh, there are some reasons to question that. But there's a change going on. And today, the greatest danger to the Middle East comes from the Islamic Republic of Iran, which is not a Wahhabi state. It's a radical Shiite state. And frankly, we're learning that we have certain common interests with many of the Sunni Arab movements and countries. Every movement, every country has to be examined by itself. But where we can find common ground, what's better than having more peaceful relations in the Middle East? So I'll have to disappoint you. 
But that's my reading of history. You're useless? I'm useless Used to this. I believe that there is one kind of Islam because according to Islam, I used to be Muslim, I'm Christian now. Okay. So uh, according to the theological teachings in Islam that you be nice as long as no, you are weak. When you're strong, then you rule. So that's... When you're strong, you're... Rule. You rule. Then you rule. Then you're, you're above, you're the master. Okay. And so, I mean, uh, when, whenever there's a need to, for to be nice as a Muslim leader, they are. And, uh, well, I did, thank you for the answer, but I disagree with that because I used to be Muslim, I used to be there. Okay. And, hello, neighbor. Hi. <laughs> um, uh, back to the diplomatic battle over Jerusalem. I don't think anything uh, rubs me wrong as much as when Yasser Arafat and now Mahmoud Abbas claim to be the, uh, the guardians of the, the mosques, the minarets, and the churches of Jerusalem. They're claimed to be the custodian of the Muslim and Christian holy sites. They always leave out synagogues and Jewish, but I, I don't like them uh, you know, claiming to look out over the, uh, the holy sites of Christianity in the land. And uh, is there anything in the Oslo Accords, in Israel's treaty with Jordan, which has some connection with uh, the question of Jerusalem from a Muslim standpoint, anything in international law that assigns them any sort of custodial rights in Jerusalem to the, to the Palestinian Authority? I know of none. And how can Jews and Christians Christian support of Israel and uh, Israeli government uh, work on affirming Israel as the proper guardian of the holy sites of Jerusalem. I, I think even the U.S. recognition of Jerusalem as the capital of Israel, that there's something implied or subsumed in that, uh, a recognition that, that Israel has done a good job in freedom of access, freedom of religion. Well, I thank you for the question because this is the future struggle. And um, frankly, I said we have a strong legal case. But we're pushing back against strong headwinds that want to take Jerusalem from the state of Israel. People don't recognize that. People um, sort of ignore the current trends. I'll tell you this. When I think of the issue of Jerusalem, I don't only think about the Jews who were denied entry into Jerusalem in the period under Jordanian rule. I not only think about 55 synagogues that were destroyed when Israel pulled out of the Jewish quarter. If anyone gets into a car or does it by foot and goes up to the Mount of Olives, what you see there is an incredible assortment of churches, some Catholic, some Protestant, some Orthodox churches, that would be put at risk if we lost our political will, or if the world pressed us to withdrawing from East Jerusalem. Jerusalem must remain under the sovereignty of Israel if it's to be protected. And the more you can underline that to your readers and to people around the world, the more you protect Jerusalem. You know, we've had history. You don't do the same thing twice. We pulled out of Bethlehem. Who set fire to the Church of the Nativity in Bethlehem? Who took the clergy as hostages? It was a combined unit 
of Fatah and Hamas in 2002. The Israeli army wanted to go in. Instead, it simply put a, um, you know, cordon around the church until the terrorists surrendered. But, you know, we've been there. We've done that. Let's not do it again. And therefore, your support, your moral support, policies you advocate, waking up sleeping giants to the danger of anyone forcing the surrender of those areas to a Palestinian government. It is absolutely essential, and it's a, it's a task I ask you to take upon yourselves. Uh, I think we all agree with, with, <coughs> with your last statement. <coughs> <coughs> yeah, my name is Malcolm Lowe, and one of my sidelines, I write articles for the Gatestone Institute, which anyone can read on. on They're very good, the uh, Gatestone yeah. articles. So, uh, in one of these articles, I touched upon the issue of UNESCO. Uh, and what I pointed out is the following. UNESCO, like many UN agencies, has a dual structure, a two-tier structure. There is a secretariat in Paris, which is largely composed of genuine experts in the, the various fields, and who uh, do, in fact, quite a lot of good work. The upper tier is an international council, uh, and this is appointed by, I think, by the General Assembly. In any case, it's, it's simply <coughs> the political representatives of a certain range of countries. It may be 30 or 40 or something like that. Uh, now, and I took the example of when the Palestinian Authority proposed to make Bethlehem an international heritage, state, uh, heritage site. The Secretariat asked a well-known organization to check through the application. And the, this organization found that the application of the Palestinian Authority failed on every possible criterion. It simply didn't answer all the things which you have to do to have an international heritage state. And so the Secretariat referred to the International Council. It recommended rejecting, and by the way, this was under the lady you've just mentioned, uh, rejecting uh, this application because it was total failure. And the International Council decided to accept it. And this is typical for what happens in UNESCO. One more thing the is merit, The merits of the case don't matter. Yeah, yeah. Now, one more interesting feature is that uh, in these votes of the International Council, typically, uh, when, it's when they're criticizing Israel, uh, there's the automatic group of states which always criticize Israel, uh, which always vote for the, for the, for the uh, resolution. There are a few states that vote against it, and many of Israel's friends simply abstain because they want to criticize, but they don't like the language of the resolution. And sometimes those against the abstain are larger than those who are in favor. And so I have a proposal which is the following. Israel is about to leave UNESCO, but what he could do, instead of just walking out, he could say the following. We are prepared to reconsider our decision if the International Council adopts a resolution calling upon Israel, the Palestinian Authority, and the Kingdom of Jordan to protect the Jewish heritage in the Holy Land, including such sites as the Temple Mount uh, Rachel's tomb, the tomb of the patriarchs in Hebron, and of course, we can mention some in Israel as well. If the council were ready to accept such a motion, instead of, uh, instead of that is a, a motion which uh, positively affirms the Jewish heritage in this land from ancient times to the present, 
Israel would consider reconsidering. Now, whether the council, there might be a, even be a majority for this resolution, and even if there were not, uh, it would make the exit of Israel from the, res from the council far more, far more uh, uh, convincing. It's a very creative idea. I'm not sure I want UNESCO commenting on Israeli performance in Nazareth. Not because we have anything to hide, and not because we did anything wrong, because they will automatically find something problematic. You know, this hot dog stand is using old hot dogs. I don't know what they'll come up with, but I, I don't, I just don't trust them. So I, my instinct tells me, don't give power to a force that you cannot trust. My name is Johannes Gerloff. I'm working for different media, uh, mainly in German, but also in Czech and English. Um, I'd like to have your advice. I have to say I have two editors of mine here, and they give me plenty of room to voice my opinion. Um, I'd like to say the situation a little bit personal. I could take the person you just mentioned indirectly, who commanded the band, who lit the Church of Nativity, Salah Amri. I interviewed him later on. But I think of a situation where I interviewed Saib Arakat and afterwards Alan Baker, whom you both know. Alan Baker works in my center, <clears throat> yes. Now, I knew who said the lie and who said the truth. And when Saib and Alan talked together, they also agreed who lied and who said the truth. Now, if I'm commenting in a Christian newspaper, I can say who lied and who said the truth. But if you want to get into secular media, I'm asked as a reporter to report. And I report what one side said, and I report what the other side said, and normal, normally nobody asks my opinion. How can I do what you asked us to do? to report the truth. You have to become a diplomat. <laughs> I'm just a television camera. It has to be short. You know, there are a lot of ways to do this. You have to report what each side said. And if you personally don't want to put yourself into the story, you can say there are very important voices who simply don't accept the argument that Mr. Arakat has been making. Finished. It's not as good as saying it's a bunch of lies, but, you know, it's not bad. Dr. Gold? Yes. Sorry. Um, I'm John Ryle, American Family Radio from the United States. Sure. And thank you for your work. Thank you for what you do. Um, you mentioned the uh, international media, much of the international media creating this fake news, this fake history about the Jewish people's ties to this land, which... Fake news is not my term. <laughs> well, I know. But fake history is. Yeah, absolutely. Absolutely. And I completely agree with that. Um, for thousands and thousands of years, the Jewish people have had ties to this land. Um, I've had the privilege of visiting the city of David, where kings were anointed, where prophets were they're, they're buried, at where King's David Palace was. This is where Jerusalem began. So um, can you just name two or three things, maybe even from the city of David, that have been discovered that once again just go back and say, you know, yeah, the, the ties go deep, deep, deep. I mean, discoveries are all over the land of Israel. Just maybe a few off the top of your head from even the city of David, if you can think of some. Well, I use the royal seals of the kings of Judah as evidence. First of all, they're written in ancient Hebrew. You know, uh, people aren't really aware of this. The Hebrew we use today, in fact, that we have used since, I don't know, not time immemorial, 
certainly going back to um, the first century AD or CE and, and maybe 100 years before, that Hebrew has what's called a Syrian script. There was an earlier Hebrew, which was the same language, same grammar, just the script was different. And we have many documents which are written in that older form of Hebrew. I think showing this to people is very powerful. You know, I have a dining alcove in my apartment. And um, the grace after meals is known as, is taken from the book of uh, Psalms, the Song of Ascents, Shir HaMa'alot. So I went to the Israeli Antiquities Authority, and they found an ancient copy of Shir HaMa'alot. And if you look at the name of God, which you know was yud he vav he in Hebrew, the Hebrew scribes at that time wrote in the Assyrian type of Hebrew that we use today until they got to the name of God. Then they wrote in the ancient Hebrew script from the time of Moses. So there's your yud he vav he but it's a different script. And every time I see that, I get chills down my spine. So expose people. Do you know that we have a site right very close to the uh, City of David, which is part of the walls of the southern wall of Jerusalem, which archaeologists call Solomonic walls. Why that term? Because they believe and they can prove that those walls date back from the time of King Solomon. Use the facts. Show people the facts.